In the last class, we looked at narration, continuing on our discussion about patterns of organization. Today, we will look at description. So, in a descriptive piece of writing, we describe a person, an object, an ideology or a place. Let us look at an example here. The sound of hot dogs sizzling on a grease spattered grill gave way to the whirling buzz of a cotton candy machine. Fascinated, we watched as the white cardboard cone was slowly transformed into a pink fluffy cloud. Despite their fiberglass appearance, the sticky puffs dissolved on my tongue into a sugar-like sweetness. Soon our faces and hands were gummed with a sticky mess. So, this is a very short descriptive piece of writing. So, what is this about? This is definitely something about a fair um, or an exhibition kind of thing. So, what is the writer here talking about? Writer here is talking about uh, some edible thing. So, then we understand that this is cotton candy. Now, one important thing here to observe is sensory impressions. So, let us go back uh, analyze these sensory impressions. The sound of hot dogs sizzling on a grease spattered grill. So, it begins with a description of sound of hot dogs. So, this is auditory image here. Then whirling buzz of cotton candy machine. So, this is again auditory image. Fascinated, we watched as the white cardboard cone was slowly transformed into a pink fluffy cloud. So, we watched, so this is a visual image. Then color, there is pink, yes. So, this is again visual image. Fluffy, this is something to do with touch. Despite their fiberglass appearance, so appearance, this is again visual image. The sticky puffs, sticky, so this is touch, dissolved on my tongue into a sugar like sweetness. So, we are here talking about uh, sweet, so this is taste. Soon our faces and hands were gummed with a sticky mess. So, this is here uh, touch and then kind of a visual image as, as well. So, by using sensory impressions which include sight, sound, taste, smell and touch, the writer here creates a beautiful piece of writing about a con county fair. It creates actually a picture, but this is a picture made up of words. Similarly, we can also create a descriptive piece of writing about a person, about a place, about a situation among other things. So, as we saw, the descriptive piece of writing helps us see things which we usually you know have not got to see by ourselves. So, we are able to recreate the picture of the county fair and uh, that of uh, cotton candy machine and tasting cotton candy by reading uh, that beautiful paragraph. So, we are able to hear new things, taste different flavors, smell foreign smells or touch different textures with the help of a good descriptive piece of writing. So, descriptive essays do this through the use of more concrete concepts and these include often 
uh, all the five senses. So, descriptive writing creates an impression in the reader's mind um, of an event, a place, a person or thing. The writing also sets a mood or describe something in such great details that the readers will be able to relive the same experience. So, this brings words to life and makes the text very interesting. So, that is you know the characteristic of a good description. Purpose. So, in the previous class, we saw that narratives can have different purposes. You may just want to recount what has happened or you may use a particular narrative uh, to reflect on your own life or uh, to show what insights you have got from that. Similarly, a description can also have different kinds of purposes. So, one is you just want to create images and mood. So, that is uh, the basic thing. You can also stimulate understanding of something or lead to action or persuasion more so in the case of advertisements. So, here the first example which we saw about a county fair and cotton candy, there the probably the writer's purpose is to create vivid images and create that festive mood um, among the readers. So, this mood is very important. You want to create a happy mood. So, the images you select will be uh, according to that. Say you are uh, aiming to create not so happy mood, you want to create a kind of sadness, fear, accordingly the images will be selected. Sometimes you may also use this description to persuade your readers. So, as I mentioned, this is often found in advertisements. So, you describe a product in such beautiful terms that your readers are compelled to buy it. So, uh, that is another purpose of a description. Now, sensory impressions. So, as key events are very important for a narrative, sensory impressions are very for a description. So, in the example we saw, we saw that there are sensory impressions from all five senses, uh, seeing, touch, smell, auditory and so on. So, these sensory impressions, they help create that same picture in the reader's mind. So, these sensory impressions are actually result of a close observation. So, that is the beginning point for your writing. So, if you uh, are planning to write a good description about something, about a place, about a person, the starting point would be to observe that particular thing, person very closely. So, appearance, uh, smell, touch, uh, what you can hear, all these things. So, most descriptions blend sensory images from different sources, so different sensory images. So, as a result, it becomes a good description. Let us look at another example here. At night, a restful stillness falls over the suburbs. Everyone has vanished inside the carefully maintained homes that line the winding streets. The children have gone to bed, leaving the occasional motionless wagon or tricycle in the driveway. 
a light gleams in some bedroom windows. TV sets silently flicker a tranquil blue in a few living rooms. The stillness is only disturbed by the brief familiar bark of a neighbor's dog. Quickly hushed, intensifying in its wake the silence that holds sway with the dark. So, what is this paragraph about? This is about suburbs, we can see here. So, what exactly it is talking about the suburbs? If you look at the first line, at night a restful stillness falls over the suburbs. So, this particular paragraph is about stillness which you can find in the suburbs. So, how does the writer build this image of the silent suburbs? Description is here so beautiful that we as readers, we can feel that stillness ourselves. There are some very good images used by the writer. So, let us go back to the text and then uh, analyze these images. Okay. So, you can see here the second line, everyone has vanished inside the carefully maintained homes that line the winding streets. So, winding streets, this creates an image. So, in this text, the writer uses images to create this beautiful picture about the silent suburbs. So, let us look at how the writer uses vivid images to create this beautiful description about the suburbs. So, first, the first line. So, a restful stillness. So, note here the writer could have simply said the suburbs become silent at night, but this beautiful image, you know, a restful stillness falls over the suburbs. So, this creates a different effect. So, this is actually called showing rather than telling, we will look at it. Um, very soon. Now, the second line, everyone has vanished inside the carefully maintained homes that line the winding streets. So, winding streets, so this is a good image and then everyone has vanished. So, so this creates an image of deserted streets. Now, continuing on, the children have gone to bed. So, this adds to it, people are not there, grown ups are not there, children are not playing. Okay. And then, uh, let us look at this phrase, occasional motionless wagon or tricycle, which has been left in the driveway. So, this image of motionless wagon or tricycle, it adds to this stillness. Then a light gleams in some bedroom windows, in some bedroom windows, not in every place. So, this is again an image, a light gleaming. Then TV sets silently flicker. So, silently flicker then a tranquil blue. So, these images all add to this overall impression of silent suburbs. Then the stillness is only disturbed by the brief familiar bark of a neighbor's dog. So, brief bark and it is familiar because you know the neighbor and the neighbor's dog there but it is quickly hushed, 
intensifying in its wake the silence that holds sway with the dark. So, the silence and the darkness they combine together. So, in this way using multiple images here, the writer creates this beautiful picture about silent suburbs. So, most of these as you have observed are auditory images. Okay. So, this is what I was mentioning. There is a difference between just telling and then showing it. So, if you have a person with you, you can take that person and show that uh, show uh, that person whatever the object you wanted to show or something like that. But your readers are somewhere else. So, now you have words and you have to use the words very carefully to show things. So, the description helps set a mood by using more vivid language to complement the sensory based description. Uh, so, for example, here rather than saying the suburb is silent, the author says a restful stillness falls over the suburbs. So, the extra detail helps readers visualize the scene that the author is trying to create. So, these words, careful choice of words, descriptions, they show us what it is like to be out there in that suburbs at night when it is eerily silent. So, the same vivid language also helps the author to create a mood for this description. So, we have noted that for a description the dominant mood which the writer wants to create is very important. Here it is a kind of you know maybe calmness and uh, you know slightly eerie feeling. So, that is the mood the writer here is trying to create. So, we can begin to experience the same calmness when we uh, look at the words like motionless wagon, silently flicker and so on. So, rather than simply telling ok, so here is a suburb, it becomes very silent after the dark because people all um, retire, children do not play and so this is really silent. So, if you simply tell, so that is one level. But if you use vivid images and appropriate vocabulary and descriptive technique, then you are actually showing the things to your readers. So, um, another aspect of descriptive writing is use of figures of speech something like simile, metaphor, personification and so on. We will look at two most commonly used figures of speech, simile and metaphor. So, what is a simile? So, simile is to put it in simple terms is a comparison. You say A is like B. So, so, for example, we say this is as white as snow, this piece of cloth is as white as snow. So, you are comparing that piece of cloth and snow. The common point of comparison is being white. There is a phrase like running like the wind. So, here is again a comparison. So, rather than saying uh, running really fast, so you can use this comparison to uh, create a beautiful image. So, let us look at an example here. And snow lay here and there in patches in the hollow of the banks like a lady's gloves forgotten. 
So, here the writer is describing snow. So, you can see here, here is the comparison, the writer is comparing snow which is lying you know in patches here and there. So, not neatly organized or not planned. So, the writer here takes another concept. So, that is a lady forgetting gloves. So, this is again lying here and there scattered. So, that is the common point between these two things. So, uh, but with the help of this simile now the description becomes more effective. Metaphor is something very closely related to simile, but it is slightly different. Metaphor is also comparison, but comparison here is implicit. So, in a simile you find words like as like for example, in this example we saw like. So, there is a word which indicates explicit comparison. In a metaphor you compare, but the comparison is very implicit. For example, Shakespeare's uh, famous uh, dialogue from one of his plays, all the world is a stage and the men and women merely players. So, this is a good example of a metaphor. So, instead of saying the world is like a stage, you simply say the world is a stage. Then instead of saying men and women are like players in a play, you say men and women are the players. There is another example here. Uh, this is a quote from Albert Einstein, all religions, arts and sciences are branches of the same tree. So, instead of uh, saying all religions, arts and sciences are like branches of the same tree, that explicit comparison you do not find. Instead, you have metaphor, implicit comparison here. So, these and many others, if you are an effective writer, you will employ several such figures of speech. These things make description very vivid and very effective. As I mentioned, another important aspect of a good descriptive writing is use of language and choice of words. So, general adjectives, nouns do not have a place in a good descriptive writing. So, you want to be very specific, you choose words very carefully. So, instead of using some general purpose adjectives and verbs and adverbs, we can use very specific words. Let us look at some examples. So, let us imagine you are describing people. So, say appearance of a person or about the character of a person. One possibility is you can say he and she is good looking, he and she is good person or he and she is bad. You know these words good and bad they are very common, but they are very general and do not mean anything specific. So, now let us look at these examples. So, instead of saying a good person, you have other words to choose from. You can say agreeable, amusing, cooperative, conscientious, meticulous, passionate, outspoken, reliable, helpful, modest, brilliant, analytical and so on. Say for example, agreeable means the person is actually not very quarrelsome and you know 
you can reach to some agreement with that person. Amusing, it is actually fun to be with that person. Then outspoken, so does not hide anything and uh, talks in a very eloquent fashion and so on. So, uh, uh, being more specific is very important for a good descriptive writing. Similarly, instead of using the general purpose adjective bad, you can think of other options. So, some of them are listed here, you can say childish, conceited, cranky, hesitant, picky, quirky, superficial, unbalanced and so on. Say childish means the person is very stubborn, does not see what others are saying something like that. So, cranky gets angry very quickly, short tempered and so on. So, um, the being more specific helps. Also, we often use the word walk, but the context actually calls for a more specific word. So, some examples I have listed here, you can say amble when you want to uh, indicate uh, a leisurely walk, falter, move hesitatingly, limp, walk impeded because of some injury, lurch, you move suddenly, meander, you move in circular course, stroll, you walk without specific aim. Actually, English has many more verbs which indicate different kinds of walking. So, imagine you are describing a person who is drunk, you want to describe the person's walking. So, instead of simply saying walk, you can refer to a thesaurus and choose the most appropriate verb there. So, language wise one we looked at figures of speech, then another important thing is very careful choice of adjectives, verbs and adverbs. The next important aspect of description is vantage point. So, what is this? So, in the first example, we looked at how the writer describes a county fair and cotton candy. So, the point of view of the narrator, so you can say that is vantage point. So, you are describing something, but where are you looking at it from? So, are you standing in a particular position and looking at it and you are describing it as you see it from where you are standing or you are on the move and hence you are observing things and you are going on talking about those things. So, there are these two possibilities with the vantage point. So, the fixed vantage point is the narrator is in one particular position and whatever he or she is able to hear, see, smell, touch, only those things are described. Let us look at an example. On the last Thursday in November, I could stay in bed only until the night chill left the house. Hearing first the clash of the heavy grates in the huge black iron range with its flowery scrolls and nickeled decorations as mother shook down the ashes. Then in their proper sequence came the sounds of the fire being made, the rustle of newspaper, the snap of kindling, the rush of smoke up the chimney when mother opened the damper. So, here the writer is talking about how fire is being made in his home, but where is the narrator? 
So, if you see the narrator is staying in bed. So, the vantage point is fixed. So, from the bed whatever the narrator can hear or whatever the things the narrator already knows only those things are described. So, if you look at this. So, hearing first clash of heavy grates in the huge black iron range as mother shook down the ashes probably uh, he is not able to see the narrator is not able to see this, but knows from this sound that this is what is happening. Then their proper sequence came the sounds. So, the narrator is able to listen to these sounds and they are described in the same order they are produced. So, the rustle of newspaper, then the snap of kindling, the rush of smoke up the chimney. So, all these things in the same order they happen. So, this is a good example of vantage point where the narrator is in one fixed place and is describing the things. In contrast, there is moving vantage point. So, here the narrator is on the move. Let us say you are just walking on the pavement and as you walk along you observe things. So, it is that kind of description. So, let us look at an example. Coffee home a food inlet set up by the Delhi Tourism Board in Connaught Place Cafe Home is an example of getting the basics right. With a quaint and breezy outdoor dining space complete with a towering banyan tree as well as a large cafeteria like indoor setting, this bustling eatery is never empty. The highlight here is the authentic filter coffee, simple straightforward and freshly brewed. A large bowl of crystal sugar is placed on the self service counter allowing the patrons to adjust sweetness to taste. The automatic brew can be paired with a smattering of south Indian dishes including masala dosa and samba voda. So, here this is description of an eatery called cafe home. So, if you look at this, this starts with uh, a brief description about its outdoor dining space and then you have some details about coffee and then about self service counter. So, this is like say you are entering an eatery. So, what do you observe first? First the outdoor settings, then you walk in through the door, you see the counter, then you see the service section, then you see the place where you know people sit and uh, dine. So, there is a kind of you know an order in which things are described and this corresponds to your movement from one place to one place. So, this is what we call spatial arrangement. So, you are moving from outdoor to indoor in this example. It could also be from top to bottom, left to right, front to back etcetera. Say you are describing a flower vase. So, you can start from the bottom and then you can move up. So, this is spatial arrangement. There is also time sequence. So, say you are describing a place, how it looks like in different seasons. So, you start from say summer, then rainy season, then winter. So, there is time sequence involved here. So, this is an example of what we call moving vantage point.
moving on the examples which we have looked at these are largely you find in essays or write ups and some examples are from literature. So, do we use this technique in research papers? So, two contexts where this becomes useful I have listed them here. One when you are giving information about participants in some studies. So, in such case this is objective and undisputable. So, that is what we call objective description and it is contrasted with subjective description. So, I am going back to this example. So, this you can say is a subjective description. Here the writer likes this place and hence you have positive images about this place. So, for example, authentic filter coffee, simple straightforward and freshly brewed. So, these are all subjective impressions about this place as depicted by the writer. But in a research context that kind of subjectivity is not allowed. So, when you describe your participants, when you describe your population it is objective. So, let us look at an example. So, this is from a study uh, done by Tyler, Moeller and Ho about difficulty faced by learners of English in using prepositions. So, they are here describing the subjects of their study, participants in their study. Let us look at it in detail. The 14 participants were professional English translators whose native language was Italian. All had studied English a minimum of 10 years. They were judged to be advanced learners. They were enrolled in a special short term program at a major university in the USA. The purpose of the program was to provide advanced instruction in English and in US culture. So, you see number here, this is a definite number, then what were these people? So, they were professional English translators, native language. So, this is standardized term in this field of study, then they were judged to be advanced learner. So, advanced learner is again a descriptive phrase, but this is not subjective. This is based on some tests conducted probably. They were enrolled in a special short term program. So, this again what is short term program? So, uh, clear parameters are there. So, here uh, description is objective in contrast to a subjective description about an eatery as we saw in earlier. Another context in research papers is what we call descriptive statistics. So, these are contrasted usually with inferential statistics. So, let us look at an example. This is extract, this extract is from the same study. Here, the researchers are describing scores of these participants on a test. The participants took a pre-test on the first day. In spite of their advanced level of English proficiency, the test revealed a number of gaps in their knowledge of the extended meanings of all three prepositions. They scored an average of 19.5 out of a possible 40 points, range 13 to 28, standard deviation 4. They were particularly weak on the extended meanings of at, scoring an average of 17.9 percent correct, as well as 2 scoring an average of 49.2 correct. They had the greatest knowledge of 4 scoring on average 72 percent correct. So, you can see that this descriptive statistics 
it includes information about mean or average scores, range, standard deviation, then percentage scores. So, these are two occasions where you find descriptive techniques in research context. Now, let us look at a long text of description and let us analyze it in detail. This is called a garden of temptation. So, let us read it in detail. Harry's farmers market is more than just a grocery store. It is a storehouse of temptation. At Harry's, a shopper can find breads and pastries, ethnic delights from a variety of countries and a selection of candies that would unravel the strongest will. But when it comes to temptation, nothing at Harry's can rival the produce section. The vegetable bins at Harry's are a feast for the senses. Row upon row of green, musty smelling cabbages, temptingly hint of cabbage rolls and coleslaw to come. Beyond the green cabbages are bins of the purple, curly leafed variety, piled like basketballs in a sporting goods store. Next come potatoes in all shapes and sizes. Large long idahos weigh in the hand like a stone and bake up fluffy and dry. The yellow fleshed Yukon golds can be sliced into golden merillions and topped with cheese. Farther along the aisle, carrots become like slender fingers and plump squash nestle comfortably in neat bins. At the end of this aisle, mountains of waxy purple eggplant lie in lush array. The vegetable bins at Harry's provide a feast for the eyes as well as for the taste buds. Beyond the vegetables lie the fruits in a patchwork of geographic and seasonal variety. Bananas, pineapples, mangoes and limes flaunt tropical hues. Their exotic aromas hint of balmy breezes, marimba bands and sweet summer nights. Across the aisle, the season is fall. Apples, crisp as a New England day, stir the air with the fragrance of autumn. Their red and yellow colors and even their names, Crispin, Pippin, Granny Smith, Ginger Gold, suggest brisk autumn days the crunch of leaves underfoot and a cozy hearth. Farther on, yellow grapefruit, bright as the California sun, suggests a return to summer. Beside them, giant navel oranges and add a hint of citrus to the air. In this section of Harris, time and place blend in a fruit basket turnover. For customers who can't wait until they are out of the store to sample the delights of Harry's fruits and vegetables, the juice bar offers instant gratification. Thirsty shoppers can drink in the tartness of a California grapefruit or taste the sweetness of freshly squeezed orange juice. For something different, customers can sample apricot juice in hues of rich dusky amber or exotic papaya flavored with coconut milk. Vegetable lovers can sip a cool pale celery drink, rich red tomato juice or carrot juice so brightly orange that many shoppers swear their eyesight improves just by looking at it. There is no better way to end a trip through Harry's produce department than by drinking it in. Grocery shopping can be a chore, but at Harry's it is more often a delight. A trip through the produce department is a tempting tour through a garden where every vegetable is in season and no fruit is forbidden. So, as you can observe this description is about a supermarket in particular about 
the produce section which consists of fruits and vegetables. So, let us look at how this starts. Harris Farmers Market is more than just a grocery store, it is a storehouse of temptation. Why? You can find breads and pastries, ethnic delights from variety of countries, a selection of candies and so on. Then look at how the introductory paragraph ends, but when it comes to temptation, nothing at Harris can rival the produce section. So, these are some general remarks to make readers get interested and then comes the thesis statement that the produce section is the focus of this thing, because um, uh, it has got lot of things to offer. So, then the rest of this essay gives details about the produce section. So, there are four paragraphs. So, if you leave out this concluding paragraph, there are three paragraphs. So, what is the function of these paragraphs? So, now we know the essay is about the produce section. So, this is dealt with in the body of the essay. So, the second paragraph here you can see it is about vegetables and this is about fruits, this is about juice bar. So, uh, this again is related to fruits and vegetables. So, this is how uh, paragraphing is done here. Okay. Let us look at sensory images. So, uh, if you look at the last sentence of the first paragraph, the introductory paragraph and also the title, it gives you an idea that the writer is going to create a positive image about this place. So, you expect lot of images which make the readers happy and uh, you know they sometimes even want uh, make you be there in person. So, let us look at second paragraph here. So, row upon row of green musty smelling cabbages. So, green color visual musty smelling smell. Then here purple curly leafed variety. So, this is color, this is uh, size and shape. Then you have a simile here comparison. Uh, these cabbages are piled like basketballs in a sporting goods store. So, this apt comparison comes here. Then potatoes in shapes and sizes, different shapes and sizes. So, there is a description there are adjectives about shapes and sizes here. Then if you come to the next paragraph, this is about fruits. So, writer see how he starts the paragraph. Beyond the vegetables lie the fruits in a patchwork of geographic and seasonal variety. So, you can expect variety both in terms of geography and season. So, how bananas, pineapples, mangoes and limes, the writer says they remind us of sweet summer nights, they are from tropical regions. Then apples, they remind us of autumn, so the fragrance of autumn, so images related to smell, they are used here. Then grapefruit bright as the California sun suggests to return to summer and so on. So, this sentence is kind of paraphrased here. In this section of Harris, time and place blend in a fruit basket turnovers. So, geography and seasonal variety. Now, this third paragraph here again, uh, this talks about uh, juice bar. So, tartness the taste, sweetness here it is again taste, uh, rich dusky amber. So, color visual images, 
papaya flavored something to do with the taste. So, writer here uses multiple sensory images to create this beautiful picture about this supermarket. The main purpose of the writer here is to describe it in a very beautiful way and focus on the point that the produce section there is actually a garden of temptation. So, it is actually it makes buyers buy things there. So, writer here with that purpose uses lot of positive images and uh, these are related to smell, touch, um, what we see among others. So, using all these things the writer here um, uh, creates a beautiful uh, descriptive piece of writing. So, moving on, now we come to how you plan and how you draft a description. So, first step could be choosing a familiar topic. Note you need to have as many details as possible about the topic you are going to describe. So, if you choose something unfamiliar or something you are not familiar to a great extent, then you would not have many things to include in your description. Then the next question is what is my purpose? So, what is your purpose? Are you going to just describe things or do you want to persuade people? Say in that uh, description about the coffee house, the idea is you persuade the readers to go there and try things or you just want to have a very beautiful description as we saw the very first one about the county fair. Create one or more impressions. So, is it a good one? Is it a bad one? So, what is it? So, depending on the impression you want to create, depending on the mood you want to create among your readers, you choose the images. Who is my audience and what might interest them? So, this is another very important question. So, if you go back to this, uh, this uh, about cafe home, this you can see that this is written uh, keeping the urban audience in mind. So, people who usually go out in the evenings to have some coffee or something like that. So, the audience you have in your mind is very important. Okay. So, now let us try to create a short descriptive piece of text. So, this is you know sounds of kitchen at breakfast time in the morning. So, what are the different kinds of sounds you hear? So, breakfast you usually um, have two things, you something to eat then a drink. So, when you lit the stove, what are the different kinds of sounds? Hissing sound, gas whooshing, hum of flame. Then when you are uh, preparing coffee using coffee maker, you have gurgling water, gloop sound. Now, on the basis of these points, let us look at this description created by Kim Burson Swigger. Sure signs of a new day are the sounds in the kitchen as breakfast is prepared. The high sigh of the gas just before it whooshes into flame and settles into a whispering hum blends with the gurgling of the water for the morning coffee. Soon the gloop 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 of the coffee sets up a perky beat. Then in mingles the crackle of creamy butter on a hot skillet and the shush of an egg added to the pan. 
the soft rustle of plastic as bread is removed from its wrapper contributes to the medley. So, you can see that this text has lot of auditory images. In fact, it is based you can say solely on auditory images. So, what is this about? As we observed, this is about kitchen in, um, in the morning and it is a usual regular uh, weekday. So, what is the mood the writer here wants to create? If you look at the very first sentence, sure signs of a new day. So, a day is beginning, you are in a hurry to go to work or to your college. So, you are in a hurry to prepare some breakfast and then leave. So, that image here is created um, using different auditory images. So, see for example, the high sigh of gas, then the gloop gloop sound of coffee, perky beat. So, all these things indicate a kind of sense of urgency, high spirits because the day has started and you have worked to. So, in this way, so you choose a familiar topic, you make a list of images and then using those images you can write a descriptive text. Here are some topics you can choose these and attempt a descriptive piece of writing. I will very quickly go through these topics. My favorite food. So, what do you like the most? So, think about the dish you like, then its aroma, how it looks like, how it tastes, how it is to hold it in hands and so on. So, once you gather all these images, then you can start writing. The cleanest place I have ever seen. So, say you have been to an airport, you were very impressed by the cleanliness there. So, this mainly here um, includes visual images, you can also include images related to smell. So, you had a uh, fragrance there, there was no dirty smell. So, again you make list of images, then you write about it. The movie I will never watch again. Say you went to watch a movie, but it was so horrible for you, you did not like it at all. So, you have to now describe the movie or maybe the, uh, the theatre experience um, was also bad. So, you here include details about the story, uh, the actors. So, here again lot of uh, visual images and then your auditory images will also be uh, uh, good for a good description about this topic. So, today we looked at description and we saw that for a good description, the key thing is to observe the topic very closely. Whatever you want to write a description about, you should be very familiar with it. And then gather as many sensory images as possible, sight, touch, smell and so on. And then you choose a pattern and it may be a spatial arrangement or moving in time sequence, um, you arrange those images. Also, it is very important to be very careful about choice of vocabulary and you can also use um, comparisons, simile and metaphor. So, all these things will make your description very effective. Thank you. Mm -hmm.